All right, uh, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, so tonight, tonight will be an interesting night. Um, we're going to continue talking about upaya, or expedient means. Uh, in fact, tonight we're going to go really deep into the idea of upaya, um, and we're going to continue reading from the sutra that we've been looking at. Um, we're going to just be looking at one story tonight. This is a, it's a pretty, um, it's kind of famous. It's not the most famous, but it's a pretty famous uh, Buddhist story called the kind of the legend or the story of the Kadira thorn. So we're going to talk about that story, um, but I kind of have a number of preliminary remarks to make to ease us back into the sutra and to ease us into this idea of upaya. So one of the things that I wanted to mention, and I've kind of been meaning to mention this for a while, it has to do with the Dharma doors with our Sunday night class and sort of my, my intentions with this uh, series, with this class, with the Sunday nights. So one of the things that I'm really trying to do here every Sunday night is, yeah, you know, to obviously talk about Buddhism and things like that, but I'm very interested in kind of promoting Buddhist culture. And so what I mean by that is, you know, I, I listen to a lot of Dharma teachers. I listen to a lot of Dharma talks. I, you know, watch a lot of YouTube videos like everybody else. And you know, there's a lot of Buddhist ideas that you hear a lot about, right? A lot of these ideas, a lot of the really important ideas. I'm not, I'm not saying we shouldn't be hearing about these ideas all the time. But I know that for me, when I first started traveling abroad as a graduate student, even as an undergraduate student, and I was going to Asian countries and staying in Buddhist uh, monasteries or temples or environments. In addition to the teachings, in addition to the practice, I was really, really drawn to the culture of Buddhism. The art, the everything about it was really appealing to me. And so with these Sunday nights, I want to bring the Buddhist culture in that way. And so I talk a lot about all these different ideas and I try to bring in all of these stories because the idea is, is that within these Buddhist countries, Buddhist cultures, there's a way in which it's not just about meditation. It's not just about psychology and suffering. It's a whole world of Again, imagery, art, iconography, stories, all of that. So here at the Dharma Doors on Sunday nights, I want to, I would like to enrich our Buddhist culture in that way and share these stories, share these ideas. So that's sort of the idea here. So my point is, is that when we read this story tonight, yeah, we want to be looking at like the, the wisdom of it, the, the teaching of it, but it's also sort of about the culture in that way. So I just wanted to kind of clarify again what my intentions are with this in that sense. Next up though, before we can get to the story, I want to reestablish the, the grand theme of upaya, skillful means or expedient means. So the sutra that we're reading, which is in this collection of Mahayana sutras, the sutra is called the Upaya Sutra. It's it's that's all it's about is Upaya. And this idea of skillful means or expedient means has been the topic of Dharma doors now for a while, for months. But I haven't yet mentioned a very important, well, it is in Upaya but it is also something about upaya. This, it gets tricky here. And what it is, is I mentioned briefly, I think a number, number of weeks ago, maybe even months ago, 
I mentioned the Lotus Sutra. So the Lotus Sutra is, um, well, it is very much about Upaya in that way. But when I mentioned the Lotus Sutra a while back, what I mentioned was that the Upaya Sutra that we're reading, it's kind of in the same genre or family of sutras as the Lotus Sutra. And what I said that night, whatever night that was, is that if, if this sutra that we've been reading, where it's a bunch of stories and allegories, if that kind of thing is interesting to you, then you should know that the Lotus Sutra is the, the ultimate version of this kind of sutra. So I wanted to mention something from the Lotus Sutra. Again, this is to kind of reestablish our thinking about Upaya. So chapter two of the Lotus Sutra is called Expedient Means. <laughs> It is all, I mean, again, the whole sutra is about Upaya, but chapter two is about Upaya in that way. And chapter two of the Lotus Sutra is famous for including or having in it a story that is known as the parable of the burning house. And if you haven't heard the parable of the burning house, I want to share it with you really quickly because it's a really great example of the, 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 the tricky nature of upaya. So the story goes something like this, and I, I, I won't you know, read it verbatim. I'm gonna give you the summary. But the story is, or the parable, is that there's a very wealthy man, very wealthy person, who has these three sons, and they live in this giant mansion, like a house. And one day, the father leaves. And his three sons are inside the house, and they're playing with these um, little model uh, carts. If you, if you were going to revamp the story for the 21st century, they would be playing with Hot Wheels cars, right? They'd be playing with little cars but they're playing with little toy carts. And all of a sudden, the house catches on fire. The father comes back, sees that the house is on fire, and so starts yelling, hey, hey kids, get out of the house. It's on fire. Unfortunately, though, his three sons were so enraptured playing with their toys that not only did they not hear their father, they didn't notice that the house was on fire. <laughs> and so the story goes that the father concocted an upaya, created a skillful means. And so he yells even louder to the children that he has these three real carts that are made of like you know, all of these precious, beautiful jewels and things like that, but they're real carts. Upon hearing about carts, these, you know, the kids' ears perk up. Carts? Ooh. And so they go running out of the house to go get their father's uh, real carts. Now, the story does conclude, by the way, by saying that the father didn't lie. And in fact, he produced even greater uh, carts for the children, carts actually that they hadn't even imagined. <laughs> so that's the parable of the burning house. But what makes the Lotus Sutra the Lotus Sutra, and we've seen a little bit of that going on here, not only do we get the parable, we get an explanation of the parable. So... The explanation about the parable is that the father of this house is the Buddha. His three children are, well, they uh, are us, or they are representative of the Shravaka vehicle, Pratekya Buddha vehicle, and Bodhisattva vehicle, the three vehicles. 
but the idea is is that the house is samsara the house is the world and it's on fire and if you've read a very important sutra from the early buddhist tradition the fire sutra <laughs> It is in the fire sutra or the fire sermon, as it is sometimes called. It's in that sutra that the Buddha expresses very clearly, the world is on fire, burning with desire. The eyes are burning with desire. The ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, and the brain are burning with desire. And so rather than feeding the fuel of the fire with more stimuli, it's about not overstimulating ourselves in that sense and kind of putting the flames of the fire of affliction out. So the idea is, is that when the Buddha first became enlightened and turned the Dharma wheel, this was our topic last week, and when he turned the Dharma wheel, he told everybody, the house is on fire, everybody. Let's get out of here. But the idea is, is that not everybody heard. Not everybody got the message because some of us were too still enraptured with our toys, our creature comforts, our this or that, whatever it is. And so the idea is, is that then the Buddha created an upaya a skillful means in order to entice us out of the house. And the idea is, is that according to the Lotus Sutra, which is really interesting, the Buddha created this idea of nirvana in order and, and described it as this, you know, beautiful state of being in order to entice everybody out of the house. <laughs> and upon hearing about liberation and freedom and hearing about all these ideas about nirvana, it encouraged us to get out of the house. So that's the parable of the burning house. It's sort of a interesting account of the sort of, well, about the advent or the arising of these different Buddhist teachings. Di different teachings, different schools of thought, different vehicles, different ideas of either nirvana or a pure land. We've talked about the idea of pure lands before. And the idea is, is that all of these ideas of like a, a pure Buddha land or peaceful nirvana, the Lotus Sutra is telling us that actually all of those were upaya to try to get us to get out of the burning house in that sense. Now, what I want you to actually notice, and this is where upaya, by the way, this is where upaya gets really tricky. It's about, it's about how the parable of the burning house is about someone enacting upaya, a skillful means, right? So it's a story about that. But I, I have just used the parable of the burning house as a teaching device. And so the upaya is operating on like two levels. It's operating in the story, but then it's operating here in real life because I'm telling you the story and in maybe possibly enticing you to leave and abandon the burning house of the six senses. So that's the really beautiful, almost mystical nature of upaya. It, it is so subtle. I cannot really, um, I really can't articulate how profound of an idea upaya is. It's honestly an idea that has yet to be fully explored in Western American Buddhism. It is just so interesting. And it's not only interesting, from a Buddhist point of view, it's very interesting from a pedagogical point of view. 
So if you're a teacher, right, then you already know about upaya in a way, especially if you're a good teacher, then you already know about having to come up with ideas and examples for specific audiences at specific times that will work for that audience. And that's the interesting nature about upaya. I've, I've often used an example of, of upaya, which is, in, it's a, uh, a hypothetical scenario. But the hypothetical scenario is about I, maybe let's say I get invited to a high school to teach, to introduce Buddhism. And the first stop is the chemistry department. And let's say I know that these, you know, they're chemistry students. And so let's say I came up with a really good example about like to describe, let's say, impermanence, but to use the idea of entropy and to use the laws of thermodynamics and, you know, ideas that chemists might be familiar with in order to describe the truth of impermanence, that all things are in a state of impermanent decay. There's a way in which the chemistry students might if I did a good job of my upaya, they might get it. Now, it would be tempting to then say that my chemistry analogy is the upaya, except the next day I've been invited to the, uh, the math department. And I start talking to the math and I'm like, ooh, my whole uh, entropy laws of thermodynamics, it worked yesterday. So I'll use that again for the math kids. <laughs> and the math kids are like, what is this guy talking about, right? Entropy <laughs> laws of thermodynamics. And so they don't get it. They, don't, they, they leave the class not understanding impermanence. Not upaya, <laughs> not skillful, not expedient. But wait. The, it, the story was the upaya, right? No, it was the implementing of the story that is upaya or skillful in that sense. And that's where upaya gets really tricky because what was upaya yesterday might not be upaya today. And that's where it's kind of up to the skill and expediency of the teacher in that way to know the audience, know the student, know where the students are at, and then employ an appropriate upaya that is expedient. I'm saying all of this actually for a very important reason as we move into this uh, story tonight about the, the Kadira thorn. So um, before I go on, though, I don't want to leave the Lotus Sutra behind. Any questions so far just about upaya in general, Lotus Sutra stuff? I, I've gotten questions before about the Lotus Sutra, and I don't talk enough about it, but. Okay, so let's get to the story. So let's see. Yeah, so this is going to happen in a few different stages, this story. I want to start, let's see. I want to start actually, and in, in, this will be an interesting way, especially given everything I just said. I want to start by telling you the way that I used to always tell this story about the Kadira thorn. So this is one of those Buddhist stories that I heard from a teacher a long time ago, and I put it in my little upaya bag of tricks, right, for later on. And I would often tell this story as an upaya, and I would try to tell it expediently. So let me tell you that version first. Then we're going to transition to the sutra. So the story of the Kadira thorn, as I heard it, was that one day the Buddha was walking through the forest. And Madhulyayana, Maha Madhulyayana, one of the Buddha's chief disciples, who is considered foremost in the development of the siddhis, of the spiritual superpowers, 
So Madhulyayana, with his divine eye that could see vast distances, from way back at the, at the Vihara, where all the monks were hanging out, with his divine eye, Madhulyayana saw in the distance that the Buddha was about to step on a Kadira thorn. So Kadira is a type of uh, acacia, acacia tree, I guess, uh, native to India, and it's known for being incredibly thorny. It has a lot of other things going on in terms of Indian culture and Ayurveda, but for this story, it's all about the fact that it's got these really sharp thorns. And Madhulyayana sees that the Buddha is about to step on one of these very sharp thorns. And so, not wanting that to happen, Madhulyayana uses his superpowers to basically, you know, teleport over to where the Buddha was. And right before the Buddha is about to step on the thorn, Madhulyayana picks the Buddha up and uses his power of flight, of levitation, and starts, like Superman, starts zooming into the sky with the Buddha. But wouldn't you know it, the Kadira thorn started growing. And the way it was described is that the thorn remained within an inch of the Buddha's foot. And as Madhulyayana and the Buddha were zooming off into the heavenly realms, the thorn just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger, chasing the Buddha's foot. And Magulyayana is putting all of his spiritual powers to work, trying to get the Buddha out of this. And eventually, he just can't do it anymore. And he flags out, he kind of peters out. And then, bink, the thorn pierces the Buddha's foot, right? Now, that's the story of the Kadira thorn, Madhulyayana trying to stop the Buddha from getting struck by it, but it happening anyways. The lesson that I was taught using this story and the lesson that I convey using this story is it's the idea, of, it has to do with karma. And in particular, it has to do with I guess what you would call karmic comeuppance, <laughs> karmic retribution. The idea of our past actions having effects, having fruition, as they would say in the Buddhist tradition. So the story of the Kadira thorn, what, what the Buddha tells Madhulyayana is that my foot being pierced by the thorn is the karmic consequence of an offense that I committed in a previous life. And the lesson is about how even the Buddha cannot avoid karmic comeuppance or karmic retribution. But what the Buddha explains to Madhulyayana in the version I heard was that we cannot uh, change karmic outcomes. What we can change is our reaction to them. And that's what the Buddha said. The Buddha said to Madhulyayana, yeah, it pierced my foot, but I did not suffer from it. So in other words, it was unavoidable that the thing should happen. But what could have happened or what couldn't have happened is that the Buddha suffers from that. And so that becomes a lesson, this kind of Buddhist lesson about karma and about the idea of past actions having consequences and that even the Buddha cannot avoid the consequences. But what makes a Buddha a Buddha is their reaction to the consequences. You may have heard a similar uh, story or at least a similar message in what is known as the, the parable or the story of the, the two arrows or this idea of the second arrow. There's a Buddhist kind of uh, analogy of this idea of these two arrows. The first arrow is pain. The first arrow is the event. The second arrow is the psychological suffering that we heap on top of the event. 
the ideas of like, why me? And oh, woe is me. And kind of that kind of idea. That's the second arrow. And what the idea is, is that we can't avoid the first arrow, but we can avoid the second arrow. Very, very similar message in the parable of the Kadira thorn. Again, as I heard it. And before we kind of move forward, I do want to dwell for a moment on that telling of the story. Because we are tonight, we are talking about karma. And in particular, we are going to be talking about past lives. And then events, or I should say actions, karma, performed in past lives coming to fruition in the present life. So we're going to be talking about that. So I kind of want to get a few things like kind of out of the way, or I want to clear a few things up before we dive deeper into the story. And it has to do with the, the, the curious nature of past lives and karma in the Buddhist tradition. This is always a topic that becomes a little confusing, especially for Dharma students who really start to understand teachings of like no self, teachings of emptiness in particular. Like when students start to really understand those ideas, they can start to have questions about all of this past life stuff that the Buddhists keep talking about. Because if there's no me, what are you all talking about with all of this past life, present life business, right? So I just want to kind of clarify a few things about how karma and reincarnation works in Buddhism. And I want to do that to kind of make a, a certain point. So the first thing that we need to understand <clears throat> is that, and I'm doing, I'm saying this yeah, everybody here, I think, already knows this, but for posterity's sake, let's clarify. Although it varies from Indian tradition to Indian tradition, within the Buddhist world, within the Buddhist tradition, karma is a very simple idea. Karma means action, and all karma means is doing things with the body, doing things with the voice, meaning speaking, or doing things with the mind, thinking. So if you're thinking, or you're speaking, or you are alive and moving around, you are, quote unquote, producing karmic activity. That's all it is. So there's nothing mystical about it. It's just the word that they use in Buddhism in Sanskrit to describe action. They divide action into bodily action, speech action, and mental action. And there's an important relationship between those three kinds of karma, which is to say the basic idea is that physical karma, doing things with the body, is very, um, what, what word could I use? Overt, obvious, um, gross, as opposed to subtle, not gross like icky, but just it's out there, it's obvious. And physical karma has physical consequences. And those consequences, the karmic retribution in that sense tends to also be overt, gross, and obvious in that sense. Oh, look, my cup of tea. Boom. <laughs> That's karmic action. I made action and there was a result. And it all happened before your eyes, all very obvious. Now, when it comes to vocal karma, things are a little more subtle, especially in terms of their results, because I might say something here tonight 
that lingers with you. And maybe a week from now, you write me an email and you're like, hey, Michael, I was at Dharma Door Sunday night and I've been thinking a lot about this. Blah, blah, blah. And then you send me the email. That's going to also, you know, I'll send you an email back. And then that would be sort of a karmic loop or a karmic consequence of that. But I want you to notice that it might take a while. And that's because vocal karma is a little more subtle in that way. But not as subtle as mental karma. Mental is so, mental karma is so subtle. What, like, watch, I'm going to think of something. You can't hear it. You can't smell it. Like, it's so subtle that it's like practically invisible. <laughs> so mental karma is like super subtle, not gross at all. And mental karma, mental karma is like, maybe I should move. And then a year later, you're packing up the U-Haul. <laughs> Meaning the mental karma happened, but the manifestation of the mental karma took an entire year to manifest. It could happen like that. So what we're really interested in when it comes to physical, verbal, and mental karma, we're really interested in that idea of the gross, the subtle, and then the most subtle. Now, I, I want to say this just because I don't always have an opportunity to mention this, and I, I really always like to mention this about karma, especially talking about the three sources of karma. I want to say something about vocal karma. So one thing, you should consider that while vocal karma is traditionally, excuse me, is traditionally like the voice, it's kind of actually more, and not more, but it, it's about communication. And so what I mean is, is that writing an email is kind of vocal karma. Even though you're writing and the literal tapping of the keys is physical karma that is having an immediate physical result, which is the letters appearing on the screen. That's, so that's immediate physical karma. But the vocal karma is like the words and their meaning that might be being conveyed to somebody reading it. And what I'm getting at is, is that whether we're talking about speech or writing, Think about this, if you haven't already thought about this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with speech for a second. So if I say whatever, you know, whatever it is, uh, uh, teacup, teacup. <laughs> teacup. So what I want you to notice is that there is a physical aspect to language, which is the sound that is hitting your ears. Teacup, 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 like the sound. But the meaning, like what that sound means, what that sound points to is mental. And so what's really interesting about vocal karma is it's literally a bridge between the physical realm and the mental realm. It has a foot, speech and writing has a foot in both worlds. And if you think about uh, writing, it's the same way. There's the physical symbol, like, uh, let's see. There's the physical symbol, and then there's the idea that this is a word or a letter or a sound. And the idea is, is that there's a physical element and a mental element. And language, it plays in both worlds. It's what makes language so interesting. And by the way, what I'm saying about the voice and, and speech and sound 
what I'm saying about it, which is that it has this physical component and this interesting mental component, this is sort of at the heart of the technology of mantras, by the way. So if you've ever done mantra recitation, you are playing with the physical realm and the mental realm. And in many ways, you are bringing them into an interesting alignment when you are doing certain mantra recitations, where there's the sound quality and the meaning quality, and they are being brought into a kind of yoga or a union in that way. So I'm not here to talk about that, but I wanted to mention that. So, okay. So that's karma within the world of Buddhism. It just means that we're always doing things with our body or our voice or our mind. And then all of those doings has consequences. But the one thing that I'm trying to dissuade anybody from thinking tonight is that there's anything mystical or magical or mysterious about karma, not in the world of Buddhism. Karma in Buddhism is cause and effect. That's all it is. That if you do this, it has that result. If you do that, it has that result. You say this, it has that result. And it's that, the, the utter mechanistic science of karma that our story of the Kadira thorn is addressing. Even a Buddha cannot change the, the laws of cause and effect in that way. That if something from a, a previous action, if it's going to have a consequence, it's going to have a consequence. But again, how one reacts to that consequence is a whole other story in that way. Okay. Questions, ideas? Okay. Last thing then is the quick conversation about reincarnation. So the main thing, and I'm going to say this, I'm going to, I'm going to express this in the way, in this way. If you are one of those astute Dharma students who understands emptiness and no self, but you have wondered about reincarnation, like how does that square with this teaching of no self, right? Like, which is it, Buddha? <laughs> are we on this endless cycle of death, birth and rebirth, or is there no self, right? Well, the idea is, is that let's say, let's say I am, let's say I am this very enlightened, you know, bodhisattva, right? Like that fully, fully understands no self, that fully understands emptiness and all of that, right? The idea is, is that even though I might be in this state of wisdom of understanding no self, I can still remember yesterday, I can still remember a week ago, I can still remember years ago, right? But what would make me an enlightened bodhisattva is that I do not identify with those past bodies. <laughs> and in fact, I am not identifying with this body either because of the wisdom of understanding the deluded nature of no self. No Michael, but as I always say, this is like becoming like my, the thing that I'm like constantly saying now. If there was an actual self ego thing, if there was such a thing and the Buddha was just telling us not to get attached to it, like, oh, it, it would be better you if you didn't get attached to that. That would be one thing. That would be one tradition. If the Buddha was saying there is an ego, but it's better for you not to be attached to it. Buddhism is saying that this idea that we have of ourself is an illusion, is a delusion. And so what we are attached to is a falsehood. 
And therefore, we would be uh, less suffering and more enlightened if we were not attached to a delusion. Not, it's not about being attached or not to something that really exists in that way, right? This is, again, the teaching of anatman, no atman, no inherent internal self. Rather, in at least in the early form of Buddhism, there is an ever-changing, ever-morphing configuration of the five skandhas. And there is the five skandhas at any given moment, such as right now, in which the senses you're having, the things you're listening to, what you're perceiving is all giving rise to a state of consciousness. Now, there is that, there is this, but the idea that there's a you that's here now and was here last week and was here a week ago and was a baby and that starts to sound like a multiple personality disorder where you are all of these different people and you're all calling them me. That's what the Buddha said is, is delusional. A self that is existing through time, but not changing, just experiencing, but not changing versus a kind of new you with every breath in that way. But, but I dare not even call it a new you, right? I don't want to reify that idea. But my point is, even in the early Buddhist tradition, this, like whatever you want to call this, is the result, the consequence of yesterday. This would be different if yesterday was different. And therefore, there is a relationship between this and yesterday, and a relationship between this and a week ago and a year ago, which is why I can remember a week ago, a year ago, years ago, because those led to this. And in a way, those experiences are still here in that way. Okay. So my point is, is that I could be attached to all of them, the baby, the teenager, the this, the that, and I could be attached to all of them as me. And in fact, that is what most of the, the default mode is identifying with all of them. Oh, and by the way, identifying with all those potential future selves too, which is what we worry about. So we're all of them. We are the imagined futures. We are the past. We're all of it. And we could cling to all of that as self and then suffer all of that in that way. Or we could get into the ever morphing, ever changing configuration of five skandhas, understand that attachment to a self is delusional and causing suffering. And what I'm getting at is is that, again, if I were to be awakened to this idea, this understanding of the five skandhas and no self, I would still be able to remember those, quote, past experiences, but I wouldn't be identifying with them as self. If that makes sense to you, then within the Buddhist tradition, there is no reason why that memory cannot keep going back further and that you could possibly remember your a last life and a lifetime before that and a lifetime before that. And my point that I'm trying to make is that those past lives are no more me than the yesterday one. But I could identify with this one and that one and that one and all of them back to infinity, which, by the way, there are some Hindu Indian traditions that are interested in you identifying with the entire thread in that sense. But the Buddhist tradition, it's more about the karma, the idea of the karma that I laid out, which is that the karmic actions from those pasts 
they have consequences that might come up now in that way. So that's a quick thing because the story is going to get into like past life stuff. And I just wanted to cut any questions off at the past that there, there can be this idea of past lives simultaneous with this idea of no self. They are not mutually exclusive, not at all, is my point. Okay, so I've, I've beaten around the bush long enough. So I, we got to get to the story. So I'm tempted to either just read the story. Uh, should I just read the story? It's only two pages. I'll just read it. So the Buddha told our Bodhisattva Nyanotara, this uh, superior wisdom Bodhisattva, who's been the main uh, interlocutor, the main questioner of the Buddha, the whole sutra. So the Buddha told our main Bodhisattva Nyanotara, way in the past, in the era of Dipankara Buddha, a Buddha from the distant, distant past, there were 500 traders who went to the ocean to seek precious treasures. With the 500 traders, there was a wicked man who was treacherous and often did evil things remorselessly. He was skilled at devising strategies. This robber constantly deprived others of their possessions, although he looked like a traitor, like all the rest. When he was in the same ship with the other 500 traders, he thought, these traders have acquired many precious treasures. I should kill them all and return alone to Jambudvipa with the loot. With this thought in mind, the robber decided to kill them all. Now, at that time, there was a man named Great Compassion, who was the leader of those traitors. In a dream, a Naga appeared to him, saying, Among your people, there is a wicked man with a certain appearance who looks like this, who is a robber and often steals from others. Now, he has the evil intention to kill all 500 of these men and return alone to Jambudvipa with their precious treasures. If this wicked man carries out this intention to kill these 500 people, he will perform an extremely evil karmic act. Why? Because all these 500 men are bodhisattvas, who do not regress from their advance towards supreme perfect enlightenment. If this wicked man kills the bodhisattvas for this grave offense, he will remain in hell for as long as the period of time from the moment these bodhisattvas brought forth bodhicitta to the moment that they will attain enlightenment. You are their leader. You may devise an upaya, to prevent this wicked man from falling into the hell realms and also to save the lives of these 500 bodhisattvas. Now, Great Compassion, the, the person named Great Compassion, the leader then thought, what skillful means, what upaya should I devise to prevent that wicked man from falling into the hells and and in order to save the lives of the 500 bodhisattvas. Though he thought in this way, he told nobody about it. At that time, the crew was waiting for the wind, which was expected to come in seven days to bring them all back to Jambudvipa, to India. After seven days had passed, uh, great compassion thought, there is no way to save the lives of these 500 persons except to put that wicked man to death. Then he thought further, if I tell these 500 people about him, 
They will hate this wicked man and they'll kill him themselves. And then they'll fall into the miserable plains of hell. Great compassion, the leader then thought, I should do it myself. Though I might fall into the miserable plains of hell and undergo sufferings for many hundreds of thousands of culpas because I killed this person, I'm willing to bear those sufferings. But I will not let this wicked man kill these 500 bodhisattvas and he suffer in hell for that evil karmic act. So at that time, the leader, Great Compassion, took pity on the wicked man and devised this upaya, thinking to himself that I'll kill this wicked man because I want to protect these 500 people. He killed him with a spear. In the end, the traitors all returned to Jambuvipa safe and sound. Now, Bodhisattva, you should not harbor any doubt. The leader at that time, great compassion, was none other than myself, the Buddha. And the 500 traitors, well, those were the 500 bodhisattvas of the Bhadra Kulpa, of the worthy Kulpa, who will attain Anuttara Samyak Sambuddhi during this Kulpa. Now, because I used ingenuity or upaya, out of great compassion at that time, I was able to avoid suffering the suffering of 100,000 kopas in samsara. And that wicked person, that work, wicked man, was reborn in a heavenly realm, the plane of good existence after he died. Now you should know this was only a display of the power of the bodhisattva's upaya. Do not think that the bodhisattva could receive obstructive karmic retributions and yet avoid the suffering of a hundred thousand kulpas of samsara. Bodhisattvas, for the sake of all sentient beings, the Tathagata, as a skillful means, appeared to pierce, appeared to be pierced by the Kadira thorn as an apparent retribution for killing that man with that spear. Once a Kadira thorn pierced the foot of the Tathagata, and you should know that it was the Buddha's miraculous power causing the thorn to pierce his foot. Why? Because the Tathagata's Vajra body, the Tathagata's Vajra Kaya, cannot be in any way damaged. And let me just finish this story real quick and then we'll chat. So bodhisattvas, once in the past in Shravasti, there were 20 people who had come to their very last existence in samsara. Each of the 20 people though, had one enemy. And each enemy thought, pretending to be his close friend, I will go to his house and kill him without telling anyone about it. At that time, because of the Buddha's miraculous power, the 20 people who had come to their very last existence in samsara, along with their 20 enemies, all came to where the Buddha was staying. In order to teach all of them, the Tathagata said to Madhulyayana in the presence of the assembly, a Kadira thorn will now emerge from the ground and pierce my foot. Thereupon, the thorn came out of the ground to a length of one foot before it reached the Buddha's foot. Madhulyayana said to the Buddha, world honored one, let me put this thorn out of the ground and throw it to another world. The Buddha told Madhulyayana, this is beyond your power. The Kadira thorn is here, but you cannot pull it up. Then Madhulyayana took the thorn and pulled it with all of his divine strength. And the entire billion fold world universe shook violently and all the worlds were lifted up. But the thorn didn't move a hair's breadth. Now, at that time, by his miraculous power, the Tathagata ascended to the heaven of the four heavenly kings, but the Kadira thorn went with him. 
Then the Tathagata went up to the heaven of the 33 levels, to the Yama heaven, to the Tushita heaven, the Dharmanarati heaven, all the way to the Paranamita Vaishavartan heaven. But the thorn went with him all to those places. It was the same even when he ascended to Brahma's heaven. Then the Tathagata returned from the Brahma heaven to his seat in Shravasti, but the thorn came back with him, jutting toward him. Then the Tathagata seized the Kadira thorn with his right hand and placing his left hand on the ground, he tread upon it. Thereupon, the whole billionfold world universe shook violently. And seeing this, the venerable Ananda arose from his seat, bared his right shoulder, and paid homage to the Buddha, then joined his palms towards the Buddha and said, World honored one, what karma did you perform in your past lives that you received this retribution now? The Buddha replied to Ananda, in one of my past lives on an ocean voyage, I pierced a man to death with a spear. Ananda, because of that karma, I received this retribution. After I had explained this karma, the 20 enemies who had originally wished to kill the 20 other people thought, even the Tathagata, the king of the Dharma, has to receive such a retribution for his negative karma. How could we possibly be exempt from karmic retribution? The 20 enemies then rose from their seats instantly, bowed their heads to the Buddha's feet and said, now in the presence of the Buddha, we repent all of our faults and dare not hide them. World honored one, we maliciously intended to kill 20 people. Now we repent in earnest, in earnestness, and we dare not hide it. Then for the sake of these 20 enemies, the world honored one discoursed on the conditions of the performance of karma and the exhaustion of karma. Having heard this teaching, the 20 enemies acquired the right understanding of the Dharma, as did 40,000 others. And this was the reason why the Tathagata appeared to have his foot pierced by a Kadira thorn. And this was all just upaya of the Tathagata. All right. So I hadn't heard that part of the story when I originally heard the legend of the Kadira thorn. So that, of course, is a very interesting story. What do we make of that story, right? So there's a number of different levels to that, to that story. The one thing that I want to say first, and I've, I've been mentioning this in the classes prior to this, all of these stories in the Upaya Sutra that we've been reading, all of these stories are found other places even this story of the Kadira thorn. And what I've been, um, what I've been trying to, to explain is that this sutra presumes that you, the reader, it presumes you know all of these stories because this sutra is actually doing something extra to all of these stories. And you heard it, and we've heard it before, and it's the language of that all of this, it just appeared that the Buddha got pierced. It was all just a display or a performance that the Buddha enacted willingly in order to convert these 20 enemies or whatever it is. So what I want to make clear to you is that the legend or the story of the Kadira thorn exists elsewhere. And in the, the, in the original version of the story, it is about the Buddha receiving karmic retribution for bad things that he did in prior lives. And there is no, it's unequivocal. The Buddha screwed up in a past life and even a Buddha doesn't get out of karmic retribution. So 
that story exists. All of these stories exist in their original form. But then this story is doing that extra thing of saying, yeah, and all of this actually was this uh, like magic show, a magical display of those things. So I just want you to kind of be aware that the story, it, it loses it loses something if you don't know that there's already this other story that's being like riffed off of in that way. So there's that. But now let's get kind of get to the actual story in that way, right? So what, what could the upaya of this story be? Well, and I mean, what could the upaya of this story be in that way? Not, you know, not even the original Kadira Thorn story, but because this is pretty morbid, right? So I could imagine, oh, and this is, by the way, too, this is why I prefaced or started tonight the way I did. I wanted to make it really clear that I was approaching tonight to sort of talk about this story that exists in the world of Buddhism. I'm, I'm obviously not really trying to elevate this story to some really high level in that way, because I think it's a, a problematic story, to say the least, in that way. But it is Ill illustrative in that sense, or it sort of is pointing to something which is, is upayak, or, or it could be upayak in the right hands. And what I mean is, this is a really kind of interesting, possibly important story that it's about past karma. And it's about this idea that, you know, in this version of the story, it was about how everybody was like, wow, even the Buddha has to suffer, suffer karmic consequences. So I would be a fool to think I could get out of karmic consequences. So that's sort of the gist of the story. It's the story, like the crux of it. It is about how nobody avoids karmic retribution. Like that's sort of the, the impetus of the story. One of the ways that I could imagine employing this upayakly is effectively, it could be used, and I wouldn't go so far as to like, you know, I wouldn't tonight want to go so far as to get into talking about grave crimes and grave offenses and all of that. But so, but just in terms of immoral behavior, let's just kind of create a large category of immoral behavior. It's kind of about how the idea, or one of the ways that I could possibly read this, it's about how the idea that if you have committed moral offenses, you too could become a Buddha. And for some, some of us might not want to let people who have committed car, uh, offenses, we might not want them to be able to come become Buddhas, right? But we would maybe want to check ourselves if we think that, right? We want to check our own compassion in that way. So again, the idea is you could read this as that it's a story about how even if you've committed karmic offenses in past lives, it doesn't rule out your possibility for enlightenment in that way. That's one way that we could read it. We could also read it a different way, which is a way that it has been read. And I want to tell you this again, not like, not as a show of support, not as a, you know, anything like that, but just to inform you about what's going on. But the story about how the Buddha was faced with this dilemma of basically letting 500 people die or one person and therefore making this upayak decision, that does become the basis for a certain kind of relative ethic within certain kind of Asian countries in that way, based upon the kind of Buddhist teaching in that sense. And these kinds of moral questions, these like moral dilemmas, right? The uh, 
the idea of the, I think it's the, the trolley dilemma, right? And this idea that there's like a, a runaway trolley that's about to run into a crowd of people or a, like a child. And it's about the moral decision to push the trolley to only kind of uh, kill one person rather than a group. That the trolley dilemma is used. I even learned about it when I took uh, my ethics and morality philosophy class. So this is sort of a an idea that's, it's a, an important idea to kind of discuss in a way about morality and ethics and those things. Because what do you do if you're faced with this decision? It's tricky. I wouldn't want anybody to be in such a position. But that is the idea that that story, this story about the Buddha making this kind of a um, utilitarian, I believe it would be called this utilitarian decision that it's 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 more utilitarian for one person rather than 500. But it, of course, raises this moral dilemma that the Buddha, even though he wasn't the Buddha, committed a grave offense in his past life. But that's where the story really wants to like impress upon you the reader it wasn't actually even about the utilitarian decision of saving these 500 people versus this one person if if you heard me when i read the story the buddha it was actually the buddha's concern for the person the the person who was going to commit the murder it, he was trying to look out for him and so knowing that this person would would wantonly and maliciously kill these people and therefore go to hell basically forever, the Buddha said, no, well, if I do it out of compassion, I'm going to still go to hell, but not for as long as he would. And so it's an interesting twist where the focus is actually the, the potential murderer. And yes, of course, saving the lives of all the bodhisattvas. But interesting nonetheless. Questions, comments, answers, ideas about any of this that we've discussed? Anything, or just ideas, again, comments about morality and Buddhism or any, anything, what have you? No? Cool. <clears throat> then I get to talk about one more fun idea. It's an idea that came up in the reading. Let me go back. I want to discuss, just because I think it would be interesting, there was a line, let me see if I can find it. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Oh yeah, so it was the paragraph where the Buddha was describing uh, the Kadira thorn piercing the foot of the Buddha. He says, but you should know, everybody, uh, that it was the Buddha's miraculous power that caused the thorn to pierce his foot. And why? Because the Tathagata's Vajrakaya, the Tathagata's Vajra body, cannot be in any way damaged. So, I don't always get an opportunity to talk about this idea either. So let's talk about that. So the Vajrakaya, whoa, what is the Vajrakaya, right? So this is a, it, it's a really interesting idea. And yeah, I have, I have enough time, I think, to sort of tease this out. So there is, so, the idea of the Vajra. So if you if you don't know, of course, this is typically a symbol, the symbol of a Vajra. But what a Vajra is, of course, traditionally is a lightning bolt or a thunderbolt in that way. This is the weapon of the god Indra, Chakra Devanam Indra, uh, the god of the sky, god of the realm of desire. So this is the Vajra. And what is the Vajra, right? This it's a it's a really interesting question. Like, what's up with this symbol, and what's up with this idea? 
Well, there's a lot going on with this symbol and that idea of a Vajra. But the one thing that I think is most important for everybody to understand about Vajra is that it is synonymous with the idea of indestructibility. All right. So you need to know that about, um, about Vajra, that it is considered to be indivisible, indestructible. So unless you get, even, even in this book, you actually get the translation of it as adamantian, right? So this idea of indestructible. But what's up with the indestructible? Like, what are they talking about? And this is where, and, and I'll mention this, but because you might, all of you might not know this either, but the the uh, uh, the Vajra as a Buddhist symbol, it really only begins with the Mahayana Buddhist tradition. You find references to the Vajra in the earlier Hinayana tradition, but it's usually references to Chakra and usually references to his lightning bolt uh, staff or his lightning bolts uh, scepter. It's only in the Mahayana that you actually start to get this language of of Vajra being used. And then of course, this language, this idea of Vajra will become its own kind of branch of Buddhism called the Vajrayana, right? So it's important to know that, that this is an evolution of Buddhism. And the reason why I tell you that is because in the early tradition in which they did not talk about Vajra, it's all about impermanence. We know this. I already mentioned it earlier a little bit. This teaching of anicca, of impermanence, it's at the, it's at the, you know, the heart of early Buddhism. The idea, not just the idea, the fact that everything is impermanent. It is just the, in the natural order of all things that they dis, that they decay that they are destroyed. That is the idea of impermanence. And so the early Buddhist teachings, or one aspect of early Buddhism, is that although we might know that things are impermanent, <laughs> there's a way in which we spend a lot of our time hoping not this time, not this time, <laughs> don't be impermanent this time. And then as soon as things change or as soon as things fall apart and we suffer as if we didn't see it coming, <laughs> as if we didn't know that that was the natural order of things. And so the early Buddhist tradition is about getting in tune with reality and reality is about all things being impermanent. And so there is a way in which we suffer when we're out of sync with that. And then we want to be in sync with the wisdom of impermanence, wisdom of no self, wisdom of suffering, the three insights, and then that constitutes sort of liberation. What I'm getting at, though, is that the focus of the early Buddhist tradition is the destructible, meaning the impermanent, and the impermanence of the world, and the suffering that arises from the impermanence of the world, and so on. In the Mahayana, though, you start to get the Buddhists talking about the indestructible. Not the impermanent, but the permanent. And this gets very tricky. And it gets very tricky because if I start, if like now, I just told you that the Mahayana starts to talk about the, the indestructible and the permanent. And as soon as I say that, our minds probably might start thinking of something that is indestructible, that is permanent. 
Because I've just said that there is this idea of the indestructible and the idea of the permanent. And so, of course, we want to know what that is. Where is that? What is that? Because, yeah, because the impermanent sucks. So where's the permanent? I want to get to it. And that's where we might miss it. <laughs> because the idea is, is that if you really, as I've been kind of been saying all night, if you really understand these teachings of, say, no self, and in particular, the teaching of emptiness, and I, if the, it is too late in the evening to do a whole talk about emptiness, but the point is, is that if you grok that idea of emptiness, which is to say that you know that these dharmas, these things that we used to, in the early Buddhist tradition, we used to think that all of these dharmas are impermanent, falling apart. But if you understand that they are all fabricated, reified delusions and are ultimately empty, there isn't anything to be impermanent. And that's the indestructible. That's the permanent this wisdom of emptiness, so to speak. But if, if, if you're really tapped into the wisdom of emptiness, there is no remainder. And what I mean by that, and I will say this, by the way, yeah, I have enough time to say this. A very important aspect of what I just said about emptiness, about understanding that all of these dharmas are just reified <laughs> illusory concept things in that way. And a very important thing to avoid is understanding emptiness and being like, oh, okay, yeah, I got it. And understanding emptiness about all of these dharmas, but not this one. There is a way in which we can understand emptiness, but not apply it to the very mind that is thinking about emptiness. And my point that I, I'm getting at here is, is that as a teacher, especially is a um, like a one-on-one -on -one kind of Dharma teacher in that way and working with a lot of people, I've had to, uh, uh, and I've enjoyed doing this, but kind of noticing and walking people out of where I noticed that they haven't emptied themselves, but they've emptied everything else. Like they understand the emptiness of everything else, but not the perceiving agent. And if you're in that mode, it can feel very dark, very lonely, because you are, have made it so that you have emptied out everything except the perceiver in that way. And therefore, the perceiver is now all alone in this empty world. And that's an unfortunate kind of alleyway of emptiness that sometimes people get kind of lost in, in that way. Rather, though, if you can kind of really get into the emptiness of all dharmas, of all phenomena, then what happens is, is that the deluded, illusory world of reified objects, including this one, gets evacuated of its seeming reality. And if you successfully do that, you can come back to the realm of what would be called tathata. Things as such. Things as so that they appear to be so. And things undeniably appear to be so. Are they so? Like fundamentally, really, inherently, for everybody, objectively? If you think that there's this, the world of objects and things that's the same objectively for everybody, everywhere, always, that's delusional. And it's really just not thinking very clearly. 
And I spend most Sunday nights talking about that kind of phenomenalism or that way in which we, we forget that we're interpreting all of this through our, the, our own lenses. And we get this false sense that it's just the world. <laughs> it's just, the why doesn't everybody think this is beautiful? <laughs> I think it's beautiful. Isn't it beautiful objectively? Why doesn't everybody think this is useful? Why doesn't everybody think this is good? Oh, that's right. <laughs> I'm in my little world in that way. It appears to be so to me. It is such. In fact, my own appearance is so, is such, undeniably. Now, where I get suffering and confused is when I objectify all of that as absolutely inherently real and true. And then I start wondering, yeah, why doesn't everybody think I'm so cool? Or why doesn't everybody think this is that or that? right? So just kind of to walk us through that. And if you followed me on that, one idea that came out of that was the idea of things appearing to be so, which is very related to the language that our sutra was using with all of these upaya about the Buddha appearing to be born, the Buddha appearing to leave home, and all of these ideas. So that's one idea that came out of that. The other idea that you could have taken away from that is when I am deluded and attached to the idea of an objective world and I'm deluded about the self and the permanent or, or you know, uh, consistent nature of the self. If I'm in that realm, yeah. I'm in suffering, I'm in Dukkaville, I'm in samsara, and I'm in samsara because I'm in this wheelhouse of chasing after these things in that way. So yes, it, that realm is impermanent. Yes, that realm is suffering. Yes, that realm, there is no self. But through the wisdom of emptiness, evacuating that delusional idea of objective objects away, and then returning to Tathata, this is more, the Tathata is more of the indestructible realm of Vajra. And I don't have time to get into exactly how it is that it is indestructible and permanent and with self, which is an interesting idea, but that is the idea. So if you followed me through that process, that idea of the delusion about dharmas, the emptiness of dharmas, and therefore the suchness of dharmas, that is sort of a, a process by which one can transcend the attachment to their perceived physical body, their rupakaya, and through a kind of journey through what would be called the akasha kaya, the space body within the realm of emptiness, one can then come to kind of embody this vajra kaya, the vajra body, which, as the sutra tells us, cannot be damaged in any way. But I would really, at right, at the, right now, want you to be thinking, Oh yeah, how could it be damaged? There, it's not. It, there, it, there's nothing there to be damaged in that way. So, questions, comments, answers, ideas about the Vajrakaya or anything I've talked about tonight. Yeah, Maria. <clears throat> so, um, if we re broaden the lens um, back to the burning house is some of the upaya here and in other teachings sort of and I when I originally thought of this I said is it kind of like a dirty trick to get us to <clears throat> wrap our minds around the idea of karma and cause and effect only to sort of pull the rug out from under us. 
um, and say, well, actually, um, that was just maybe here, Upaya, to help you um, find your way out of this uh, delusion around things actually being there. Mm -hmm. Is this getting there? Oh, yeah. Great question. So first thing is I want to I want to remind us of the an aspect of the story the parable of the burning house and it was about how when the when the kids came out of the house not only did the father really have the carts the carts were actually better than the kids imagined so that addresses the idea of the rug pull sort of idea a little bit but I want to share with you quickly in the time that we have, or m m moments that we have left, I want to share with you a, a, a way to think about that. The way to think about that, and because I, I think about this a lot, and I, and I wind up sort of teaching this a lot. It has a lot, actually, I didn't even until this very moment, I didn't realize how related to the parable of the burning house it is. So it has to do with sukkha. So we all know about dukkha, right? The suffering. But the exact opposite of dukkha is sukkha, bliss, right? Now, the idea here is, is bliss, sukkha is pleasure, enjoyment, all of these things. And the idea is, the basic idea of, of Buddhism, as I would summarize it, is that we have outsourced our pleasure. And what I mean by that is that most people are conditioned to receive pleasure from externals, from seeing things like watching things, from listening to things, from eating things, smelling things, being touched, touching, and even, of course, thinking, doing crossword puzzles, Sudoku, all kinds of mental activity. So the idea is, is that if I have my this, or if I have my that, I'm happy. What the Buddha realized is that that's a recipe for disaster because the moment you don't have your thing, you can't be happy. In fact, if you do that long enough, you've conditioned yourself to need things in order to be pleased. Now, the idea here is, is that, that that's a mentality, a mentality that is conditioned to receive pleasure from externals. So a tr the trick is, is that the way that I teach Buddhism is that there is a much, much greater bliss, a much higher sukkha that comes from not needing anything. In other words, joy on demand, so to speak, because it is not dependent upon things. It's not conditional. It's unconditional. Now, the thing about that is, is that I could probably tell all of you the bliss of independence, the bliss of sovereignty being independent of things. But the idea is, is that if a mind is so conditioned to receive pleasure from externals, like our children playing with their toys, then we might not be able to convince them of the, the bliss of liberation, or sorry, the bliss of, of not needing anything. So it might be that there's kind of that enticement of greater pleasure from a you know whatever it is only as a stepping stone to a level of pleasure that a conditioned mind couldn't even fathom and that's the idea of the buddha actually giving a much better cart but to the mind that's conditioned to need things again it might not make sense that you could be happier not needing anything so that's kind of a sort of an answer. 
<laughs> definitely a follow-up. So, all right, everybody, I'm going to conclude tonight's talk. Hope you all enjoyed it.